Here we go with more Tower of God cut content. This is episode 7 cut content. A princess's secret from Anak, Vern, and Endorsey. Let's go. Episode 7 served to develop a lot of the other characters. Not only did we get a look into Anak's past, but we also got to see what's behind Endorashi's usual common composed personality. This alongside- Whoa, Aninus is using a new style of editing where he's just basically fast-forwarding the anime scenes so that he can play clip for a longer duration and have it just going. Side the copyright building details and combat mechanics were among the cut content for this episode. Okay. So let's do as we usually do and take a look at what exactly we missed out on from episode 7 of Tower of God. But first, ad coming? We'll start things off at the no beginning ad. of the fisherman test. The instructor for this class was a ranker named Hex. Rather Hex. than give them a lecture, she instead decided to oh, have she was them a take part in a special test of sorts. Be one of the eight people to remain standing on the platforms and you pass the test. Yeah, basically don't Not fall. Not only that, but your ability to make the others fall off was being assessed as well. If anything though, this test was designed to be more like a culling of the initial group. The ball wasn't so high that anyone would die from it. But it was it enough to a make lot. you too injured to participate in the next class. So falling <laughs> here was essentially the equivalent of failing altogether. There was definitely a lot more at stake here, and that's what the instructor wanted to make clear. So both Anak and Endorashi now had the opportunity to take the other out of the test for good. It also made the test itself a lot more stressful for the other regulars. Though for someone like Endorashi, she didn't really have to work. Every time Aninu says Endorashi, the English subtitle reads it as Indotasi, bro. Look at this. Stressful for the Indotasi. Other Though for someone like Indotasi, yeah, she in didn't really have to worry at all. I mean, she was well aware that no What the fuck do they do to her, bro? The princess's face. <laughs> These early designs. <laughs> they just look so good. They look amazing. No one would be dumb enough to challenge her. Besides, it's unlikely that anyone aside from Anak could even make the jump across to her anyway. So really, all she had to worry about was a single person. Of course, if Anak was smart, she would ignore Endorashi and rack up the points from the others. But it's for the very reason that Endorashi was who she was that Anak was challenging her in the first place. So after their initial confrontation, the comment Anak made about Endorashi being a You're also fake seemed to strike a certain nerve. It's why she decided to throw away her needle. She wasn't going to need it to teach this imposter the difference between hand a real princess and a fake. That's how confident she was in her own ability. Now, before the fight could go any further, we switch over to the classes with the light bearers. Fuck it's you, Rachel! We get our first look at the lighthouses and their functionalities. But since I'm doing a video on all the positions later this week, all you really need to know for now is that lighthouses work towards gathering and controlling the flow of information. That yeah, it's pretty much just like this like computer space where you can go beep boop beep boop and do stuff, and it can be used as like levitation and using as like a utility stepping stone to you know movement. That's pretty much what we see Kun and Rachel doing here. Their current exercise was to use the lighthouse to gather information on their fellow regulars. By using the data search cube and connecting it to the main cube, Kun could inquire on anyone that he wanted. It was a good opportunity to look into the case involving the two princesses. You see, Kun was suspicious of Anak because only one princess was chosen every couple hundred years. Hundred so for there to be years. two in the same group of regulars, well, that Pretty was highly abnormal. That's when it dawned on Kun that the fact that Anak had the Green April was a red flag in and of itself. Reason being that a weapon from the 13 month series can only be given to a chosen princess. The okay. keyword here being chosen. Chosen. In order for a princess. Not every Zahad princess is a chosen one. There's a lot of Zahad princesses, but specific chosen ones are given the 13 month series. Says to be chosen, they first had to be a ranker. So Anak having okay. Green April and being on the floor of test, and that's why Endorsey doesn't have one because she's not a ranker. Were two things that she's just not chosen didn't coincide yet. with each other. That's what led Kun to find the fate of the real Anak. Switching back to the fisherman test now, Endorashi was leading Anak in a way that would cause her to knock out all the other regulars. She was basically getting Anak to do all the work for her. It was intended to highlight their difference in power by showing that she could still make the others fall off while only dodging. Okay. Even after Anak used Shinsu to strengthen her body, Shinsu she movements. still found herself to be outmatched. By now though, Endorashi had seen enough to figure out who exactly Anak was. You see, she was already aware that the real Anak Jihad died long ago. Chicken but pie the incident. fact that the Anak in front of her now possessed both a similar power and the Green April meant only one thing was possible. She had to be Anak Jihad's missing daughter. 
This brings us now to the beginning of episode 7, Lunch okay. and Tag, covering chapter 33 to chapter 37 of the webtoon. We start things off with a slight bit of exposition behind Whoa. the king and his princesses. The king wasn't just the first person to climb there. the tower. He was the first person to ever make a contract with the tower's administrator. Got Only it. after using that power to establish his own kingdom did he start to introduce... I love how he just kind of uses... Well, actually, no, this is a different contract, but, like, this is also the test. Remember how King... Like, later on, because we're done with the season, by the way. Uh, there was a scene where it's just like uh, Yuhan Sun kind of wanted to see if Ban would take that test to talk to the admin, just like how King Zaha did, right? Kingdom, did he start to introduce the princesses to the world? These princesses were more than just displays of Jihad's power, though. Each of them served as a sword whose sole purpose was to protect the kingdom that Jihad had built. Okay. Because they were so powerful, many residents of the tower began to worship them as gods only adding to the fame they already had as daughters of the Ten Great Families, of which we were given our first glimpse of each of their sigils. Okay, so there is sigils of the Ten Great Families, and obviously Anonyu's, you know, hid this, you know, text bubble to, you know, hide, you know, more sensitive information, but... So all the princesses are poached from the Ten Great Families, because obviously they're going to be, like, the most elite. Now, though the details aren't quite mentioned, the princesses were in fact given a portion of Jihad's power in a special way. How? The only thing we know about it is that it didn't involve having his blood flow through their veins. Okay. No, the power was transferred through some other means. Shinsu? So that's a bit more know. context behind the princesses and their power. It leads us into the story of Anak's mother a little bit better. We learn that after she was chosen to become a princess, she quickly rushed to become a ranker. It was her ability she displayed while doing so that allowed her to receive the Green April as a reward. The thing is, the real Anak Jihad secretly loved another man. <gasps> Chicken pie man! And that love resulted in a baby that she couldn't possibly give up. Tainting the blood of Zahad is what Renpo said. But it's like, what do you mean? It's like, what do you mean? We don't even have Zahad blood. But I think that implication was Anak is the daughter with, you know, imbued with, you know, mixed with Chicken Pie Man's blood. And if you're going to consider yourself a princess, Zahad name associated with it, then it's bad, and I think that's the implication. So, with very few options remaining, the only thing that she could really do was run away and hope to never be found. It didn't take long, though, for the king to hear of this news. And when he did, he immediately ordered that they be found and executed. However, the Green April was never recovered. It gave birth to this rumor that perhaps Anak's daughter was still alive and now possessed that weapon. A rumor that was only recently proven to be true. Mm -hmm. This whole situation was something that Indotashi couldn't quite understand. Indotashi. She wanted to know why her sister would choose the misfortune that came with bearing a child over the life of luxury she could live as a princess. It's called it love. It was a question that brought back the memories of when Anak was with her mother. What we didn't get to see in the anime was how Anak's mother was always complaining about the life that she had chosen. She'd always get into these arguments with the man that she had married. Then she Oh yeah, she fucking hated the chicken man. This whole marriage was a sham, right? She'd continue to walk around the house and state how great her life would have been had she not married him. Yeah, and then she also said, Anna, and then Anak, little Anak says, I like it when mommy and daddy fight, because after they fight, daddy always makes me chicken pie afterwards. Yeah, keep beating his ass, mommy. It always made little Anak wonder why her mother got married at all. So, when she finally asked, her mom would always say that she'd been tricked. Seduced really? by the temptations of this man who promised her- <laughs> She got- a Zahad princess got seduced by a chicken chef? Chicken pie man? That chicken pie must have been so fucking good, dude. For happiness. Yet, the way that she said this didn't seem to bear any resentment. Despite what Anak's mother was saying, she always looked quite content with the way things were. From what Anak could remember, her mother didn't actually seem unhappy with the choice that she'd made. The only misfortune she'd experienced in her entire life was when- Was when the chicken pie fucking- We forgot to take it out of the oven. It's on fire. Dead. I think Ren was part of this, right? I think it was implied that Ren from Zahad Police Forces, he was behind this incident? The man who tricked her into marrying him died at the hands of her own sister. It's the reason why Anak was where she was now. Her being on the floor of test was to get revenge for the death of her parents. The only goal she has is to kill every jihad in the tower. <laughs> starting, of course, with Endorsi. As we saw, this- Was it a different princess, actually, that showed up? Or was it Ren? I forget the dialogue. Ren was, like, talking some shit to Anak and talking about the incident with the mom, and 
the way he was describing almost made it seem like he was involved in that incident. Only resulted in both of them falling off the pillars. So, as they lay next to each other wallowing in their own defeat, their initial banter leads us to find out that Anak is actually older than Endorisi. Meaning- Yup, hundreds of years. <laughs> how does that work, bro? How, do, how the f- The age- And like, Anak is older than Endorisi. And, and Endorisi also- Here's the thing, Endorisi is like 300 plus years old or something, maybe 500 plus, and she's calling Serena a hag. Serena, who is actually like the most normal human in probably age, right? She doesn't know how to use Shinsu to use Shinsu makeup and make her look young. So it's like, how the fuck are you calling her a hag when she's like, you know, you're like 300 times more older than her. That Anak is also over 300 years old. But as I mentioned last episode, because Shinsu can be used to stop the body from aging, yeah. age is pretty much a meaningless number within the tower. When I say Shinsu makeup, I mean like aesthetic wise, right? They just age slowly in the tower, but aesthetically they are younger, right? It's not saying, like, it's not just covering up their wrinkles. Like, semantics again, come in on. As I use notes, years lived is far less important in comparison to the body's age and racial traits. But what residents of the tower care about the most is power and position. That's what dictates seniority. It's why okay. Kun, Yuri, and Indodesi can take on such an informal tone with everyone. <laughs> Their status as a member from the Ten Great Families automatically places them above everyone else. So interesting in Korea, basically, you know, in, in Asia mostly, if you have to respect your elders. The way you speak is specifically different in honorifics. But here, it's just like power makes all. It's just might makes right. All merit. And then a little baby toddler could talk down on you because they're stronger than you. In any case, the two princesses would eventually calm down and have an actual conversation. Leading us into another flashback of Anak's last moments with her mother. What if King Zahad is a Shoda? That would be so infuriating. If a fucking Shoda, this little boy, you know, is just like, because he's the strongest in the tower, he can do, he's the fucking king, you know? Other than the entire forest being set ablaze, the only difference was us getting a glimpse of the man who helped Anak escape. We don't oh. really get a good look at their face, but the man it was definitely who someone who resembled Evan. What? Yeah, the hairstyle right there, right? That is clearly Evan's hair. Well, it kind of looks like it, but who knows, really? Who knows? Dumbled Evan. But yeah, that was pretty much it for the princesses. At least the parts with Anak, anyway. Now we shift back to Bam and the rest of the wave control. Fuck you, ho. Even with all this training, Bam hadn't surpassed Ho yet. Both could only pop two balloons at most during the exercises. What? In the anime, it, it, it made it really seem like they're not close at all. Ho was ahead right now. So, Ho was rather relieved to see that he was still on par with one of his rivals. Ugh, what was rivals. issue though was that Larry was now teaching Bam how to control Shinsu better. Even though the two were competing for the same spot, Larry didn't care as much since he knew his position was <laughs> I don't care. I'm gonna win regardless. Guaranteed. Yeah. Regardless of how he did on the tests or how much Bam improved, nothing Doesn't would matter to me. Fact. So, in actuality, there was only one wave controller position left. And that's what made things all the more stressful for Ho. While not too many people were able to identify Ho's imminent breakdown of character, Hua De Yun is shown to be one of the few who has. Mm. It's more clear that this is the case in the webtoon since they dedicated so many panels to it. In the anime, there's nothing like that until episode 13 where it's all revealed and Hua De Yun is basically working with Yu Han Sung and they seem to be in this separate faction because Bum, they're being tested. He's being tested to see if he truly is the child that, you know, I forget the exact line. If he is the kiss or something that we're looking for, like something for our desires, right? So clearly, she already knew from the beginning. They was all planned. Anyway, as Bam and Kun discuss Endorisi and Anak's current situation, Kun found the whole thing to be comedic, whereas Bam wanted to help. It's here that Kun finally decides to confront Bam on his white knight personality. Good. You see, Bam always Stop being a to simp. have the naive idea that he could simply help everyone all the time. But that was a mentality not suited to climbing the tower. Is he going to keep this innocence as he moves forward? I mean, that's another thing that they said, right? It's like, Bomb has that purity, that innocence. There's something that everyone else lost, right? I want this kid to be become hard up, bro. I, I fuck, fuck innocent, naive Bomb. I want a different Bomb, bro. I need him to become an absolute fucking Sigma, man. So what Kun wanted to help Bomb understand was that with the way the tower was structured, his or anyone else's success will always come at the expense of someone else's. 
Bam was only where he was now because he made someone else fail. And if he chooses to continue his journey up the tower, then he'll have to make other people fail as well. It Good. was impossible to follow through with the ideology that everyone could be happy. God wasn't so kind. If that was something Bam had a problem with, then he'd have to take it up with whoever that god was at the top of the tower. He could just go change the system, yeah. If he really wants this utopia where everyone's gonna be happy, I mean, he could will it into existence if he became the king of the tower. Yes, those were harsh words to hear, but it was the truth. Though, even after saying all of that, Kun did actually have an idea that could assist most of Bam's friends. As we saw, bribing and Dorsey with food was the best way to help Shibisu and Luxury Alex meal. Past all while conserving the little points that Endorsey had left. So, as Bam tempted Endorsey by literally dangling food in front of her, there was a bit to their conversation that went to developing Endorsey's personality. Oh? It was in this moment that Endorsey went from her normal, calm, and composed manner to that more fitting of a modern teenage girl. She is. For context, twice we've seen her order the special meal in the anime. Yeah. In the webtoon, this meal was one that didn't have any meat on it. The deluxe so set. it's for personal reasons Diet. that she chooses not to eat any meat. Diet. No matter how much Bam would insist, she would continue to refuse to eat the eel. The thing is, she also didn't want to make it seem like she was on a diet either. So, as she kept- Classic, beauty-obsessed, Korean girl. Mentality. Oh, I'm gonna die. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, it's not specific to Korean girls, but it's like... Do you guys like Endorsey's personalities, by the way? I think that it is funny and charismatic at times of how self-aware of she is of her own beauty and steps over people. And I'm sure a lot of masochists, you know, would just like, they, they, they're just not thinking about that. But if you really look beyond that, right? See, yeah, is hot. That's the only thing you care about. If you really, like break down her mentality of the way she even perceived, you know, the whole hierarchy of how she had to eat, you know, shitty food because she was weak and in order to eat better food, she had to kill everybody. I feel like, and this is fitting of a teenage girl, but like her entire perception is so twisted and naive and looking out for myself, crab bucket mentality. She is extremely rude. She is extremely in vain. And I don't think she's a terrible character. I like her a lot. But if you actually just kind of stop letting your dick make you, you know, think of a character, like instead of using your dick to like measure whether or not you like Endorsey or not, if you really think about it, she is pretty shitty in season one. She's really shitty in season one. There's a lot of moments where she's extremely shitty and that's playing into her character. And there's also good moments where she's looking out for a bum. I think those are the best moments of her when she's talking like to Rachel and stuff like that. She's like, you better make sure that the star in the top of the tower is better than bum. Those are some of her great moments, but, you know, it's the early game. They're trying to set this character and the way that she survived. Clearly, like, character development for these characters is going to happen much later in the seasons. But, like, in season one itself, yeah, I get the hype, but, like, some of the things was like, damn, she's such a bitch, but it's pretty realistic for, like, a teenage girl living in this, like, survival at no, you know, at all cost kind of life. Making up excuses as to why the eel was bad for her, she slowly became more and more like this normal modern girl putting on a personality more fitting to the age that she looked. This was the, the age true that, she looked. that existed behind the princess. A girl that has yet to fully mature. Yeah, but exactly. More than that, fully she's mature, a exactly. She's girl that goes to great lengths to take care of her looks. A girl that stresses about how much she weighs. And even though she may not seem like it, she's a girl that enjoys being called pretty by the others. Like, very realistic depiction of like a teenage girl, I think, right? All in all. This was a really good scene to help push forward Endorsey's character. Kind of humanizes it even her ended too. ended on a symbolic shot of her high heels that she finally decided to set aside. Almost as if to mark the beginning of when she's starting to mature. Really? I thought she kept wearing those. In the webtoon, probably different. I thought that she kept wearing these in the anime though. To set aside. Almost as if to mark the beginning of when she's starting to mature. <laughs> she got different I mean, shoes in the webtoon. Like she's changing as she's only seen wearing regular shoes. After. Oh! Oh shit! Yo, she got the sneakers? Yo, she got them kicks, but the anime didn't do that? What? Come on, that's like an actual nice touch to really represent like, you know, she's put outside the side high heels. Enough of that, she's become more accepting of who she is really instead of trying to put on this fake persona, right? Showing that she's starting to care less about how she looks and, as you'll soon see, more for mm. the others around her. Okay. Anyway, Shibisu was given the same task to handle with Anak. Except, Anak was a little less understanding and immediately demanded that he put down the food. 
Of course, out of fear for his own life, he obeyed without saying anything else. Okay. Now, when we chicken get to pie, the chicken pie there. Unlike how the anime showed Rachel's Yeah, that's right. Buy your shitty ass fucking 70 count, 70% discount apples. Yeah, save your fucking money. Yeah, save your fucking points. Eat those rotten apples. Cafeteria. Unlike how the anime showed Rachel saving her points, she was actually spending more so that she could order her food as takeout. What? While she waited for her meal, she could overhear everyone else talking about Bomb's encounter with Yuri. <laughs> <sighs> Rachel needs to suffer. She needs to suffer. I hate her so much. I hope you hear about how Bomb is so popular. Why you take takeout food and you can't sit with the popular kids. Even though you could if you could just open up your fucking heart. As it would turn out, Yuri's actual nickname was the Effenberg of Jihad. Effenberg? I thought she was like the imp of Zahad or something. Like, she's such a diehard, like, zealot warrior for Zahad. Wasn't that what the anime said? Reference to the German soccer player who was known for his volatile and aggressive personality on the field. Oh, interesting. But I guess imp soccer implies reference. the same thing anyway. Yeah, imp. Next, we have the scene with Endorsi and Rachel. This is a great scene. The anime made it seem as if Rachel got frustrated by what Endorsi said. Yeah, she's like, who the fuck does that bitch think she is? But really, it was practically the opposite of that. Rachel showed absolutely no response to Endorticy's words. Huh. She honestly couldn't be bothered by them. Really? On the other hand, she was locked in? The anime really makes Rachel more hateable then, huh? Because the anime obviously knew in season 1 what was going to happen. The betrayal at the end of, you know, episode 12. So that's why the anime made her even more, I guess, hateable. To kind of compound on that... Such that when you get to the betrayal scene, it's just like, holy shit, you know? It's even worse, the betrayal. And Dorothy seemed as if she was rather perturbed by the one-sided relationship Bam and Rachel shared. Almost to the point that she would just go and reveal everything to Bam. So, it would seem that Endorticy is becoming a bit more sympathetic towards Bam over Rachel. Yeah, After that's a good this, moment. we get to another one of the wave control- Like again, you bet, I, I hope whatever you're chasing at the top of the tower is more important than Bum. That was like a great line. Anytime like Endorsey is like vouching for Bum when talking to Rachel and stuff like that, those are great moments. Fuller lessons. This one went to explain a bit more about how Shinsu worked in combat. Wave controllers utilize Shinsu in clusters referred to as Bangs. Bang. Each Bang is- Bang is called a room, by the way. If I'm- if I could see the Korean letters, then I could understand, but like, if he's gonna say Bong, that literally means room. It's one ball of Shinsu and is made up of two components, size and consistency. Okay. <laughs> Myonsu, okay. ...are very important, but what matters most is the number of Bang that any individual- The more rooms you have, so it's like, you got a dual core processor, I got a quad core processor. It's basically how many different Shinsu rooms can you multitask? And the more Shinsu rooms, these bongs that you have, the stronger you are. Wonder how many Alare could use. Yo, I wish they explained this shit. This could be used in such a power fantasy moment in the future where it's just like, you know, everyone's fun. It's like, like, whoa, this dude can use two rooms. And bomb shows up out of nowhere. Boom. Ten fucking rooms. And it's like, no way. You know, they could totally have a moment like that. But if they don't, and if they don't explain like, the significance of this, then it's, it's, it's just lost in translation. Dual can control. Reason being that if you were to fight someone who could control more bang than you, then they would always be able to overwhelm yeah, you. Yeah, it's just attacks. more Shinsu attacks being controlled. It would be impossible for you to block all of them since you couldn't match their output. The thing is, controlling multiple bangs is one of the hardest things to learn. Mm. It takes great skill to match. As in, Bum will just absolutely master it. So let me guess. At the end of episode 13, Hwaryeon and Hansung is basically, they're gonna train Bomb, right? I don't know what the cause is, but like, they're basically using this kid and, and then it's just like a training session. Bomb is so good at Shinsu techniques, he was able to immediately use what Quan said. You know, if submerge someone in Shinsu and stunlock them. He got mastered that immediately. Bro is gonna have so many rooms. Bro is gonna be the biggest room Bong user, man, in this fucking show. Master the materialization of more than one. It's almost like trying to learn how to use multiple arms. Even learning how to use one bang took two years for Yuga himself to master. Two and years to then, multiple rooms? Him a genius. Yet, here was Bang, two weeks later, having performed the same feat. Nani. So what did that make him? <laughs> the fucking chosen one, the main character. I don't care, Rachel's not the main character. Rachel, fake character, uh-uh. Rachel, not main character. Rachel, fake main character. This is the true main character. Yuga was well aware of Bang's significant talent. And because of that, he wanted Bomb to know that his talent will inevitably be the root cause of others' envy. 
Hmm. This was a ho already. Ho, ho, ho. Very important lesson. Yeah. And it leads us into Ho's scene a bit more ominous. Yeah. As Bam continued to excel at controlling Shinsu, Ho's goals began to stray farther from his sight. Skill issue! It brought with it this crushing sense of defeat that he felt he could do nothing about. Skill that issue! Was up until he received the note. The note from Hwaryun and Hansung. I thought it was from Rachel, but it was all planned from the beginning. And then Hwaryun went to Rachel and says, Look for the sign. You will know the sign. The webtoon. This scene had additional important details that the anime left out. The note itself read the following. It made it very clear that it Make Michelle Light fail the test. Make Palm fail. I've got an idea. There's She's the reason Palm's going up the tower, and she's not your friend. Oh, they added way more context here. In order to make Palm fail, all Ho had to do was use Rachel. Clearly, someone had taken note of Ho's distress. The pronunciation of Palm and Pong is really familiar. It is not. Mr. Annie News is kind of butchering it. Pom is an M. Pong? Pom, Pong, Pom, Pong. Yeah, never mind. It is pretty familiar. That NG and Pom, P A A M, Pong, P A A N G, that, that M and the NG sound, it does overlap. You're right, you're right. But when he went outside to check who that person was, no one could be found. The commotion Ho was. The master of Bong's Pom. <laughs> this is like. <laughs> So it it, no, there's no. It means totally different things. It's phon phonetically, it sounds similar. It's not like you know, pongs were fucking made for bomb. No, but I bet he's gonna be able to use it so easily. Was making caused his neighbor to come out and check what was going on, but Ho, with a now calm expression, simply disregarded him, leaving his neighbor to wonder why he was acting so strangely. Palm means night. That may it not could also mean chestnuts too, now, though. But it does have some meaning later. Anyway, that brings us right to the start of the joint test, the main event of next week's video. Tag so time! Sure subscribe so that you don't miss that one or the video on all the- I know, and the reason why, you know, we finished the season before, you know, getting on these because, obviously, I didn't want spoilers. Dude was spoiling left, right, and center with the previous videos because he made this series after season one was completed when this show was airing. I think what's going on. Please go give him a like and a sub to his channel if you haven't. We will, don't worry, get every episode. All the episodes are out on Patreon already. We're done. So, I'm gonna stagger these releases such that every episode's gonna get its cut content and line up just in time for- July release, which is actually still a ways to go. Tower of God's not coming out for like another week and a half or like almost two weeks, but that's it for me.